So mammals. What's the deal with them? I mean, mammals nowadays are the dominant large animals. There are many, many different shapes and sizes, and mammals are some of the most diverse and magnificent animals alive. And earlier, even before the times of man, they were equally, if not more, amazing. Indeed, most of the Cenozoic, the geologic era we have lived in for some 66 million years, is usually titled the Age of Mammals, as for millions of years in prehistory, we have had countless examples of astonishing, hairy creatures. Well, what about earlier? As many of you know, mammals only began to prosper because of the extinction of the dinosaurs. Before this, they were small vermin hiding in the shadows of the larger reptiles. So how did we get from these humble beginnings to modern and prehistoric marvels, from mouse-sized to mammoth-sized? Well, what we do know of the early stages of mammal hegemony, at the very beginning of the Cenozoic, still remains a hazy and mysterious time, but paleontologists have uncovered enough to begin and piece together the early steps of the mammal's global conquest. The world after the dinosaurs was still one that would look very, for lack of a better word, Mesozoic-y. By this point we had transitioned from that era into the Cenozoic, but the globe was incredibly warm. There was no ice at the poles, and a great deal of the land was a tropical environment. Huge swaths of rainforest covered the equator like they do in the present, but humid tropics also popped up in areas like the middle of Siberia and the Mediterranean. The warmth also means arid land sprung across vast spans of the earth that would become China, North Africa, and Central America. The jungles would possibly have been very dense, due to the loss of any large herbivores who could feed on the trees. It is in this warm and jungled land where mammals would first thrive. In the Mesozoic, mammals had been unable to grow any larger than an opossum. Most were nocturnal and insectivores. A lifetime of being on a permanent night shift, eating bugs for lunch, may not sound too appealing to us, yet it was because of this some mammals endured the KPG extinction. Their small size and generalized diet means when bigger animals starved to death, mammals were what was left and could now evolve and fill the spaces dinosaurs held for many millions of years. This is actually a subject I've talked about before, being adaptive radiation, where empty ecological niches become quickly filled by the survivors. But the earliest period of the Cenozoic did not see a complete replacement of the dinosaurs yet. Most mammals still remained small and basal. In fact, some mammal groups were hit nearly as hard as the dinosaurs, only surviving through their most humble forms. Of the mammal groups who did survive the Cretaceous, us placental mammals, who are the most successful of the mammal groups nowadays, were actually one of the more diminutive survivors. We were competing with, at this point, the much longer-lived and successful multituberculates, as well as marsupials. As I've said, both groups had first survived the extinction as small, generalized animals, ones anybody could mistake for simple rodents, although a closer look at their taxonomy and skeleton tell a different story. Multituberculates, who I would just start shortening to multities, are only distant relatives of the placental mammals, having evolved during the Jurassic period, and would persist for 100 million years, the longest of any mammal lineage. One of the more well-understood genera is the Tylotus, a squirrel-like tree dweller, and like a squirrel they possessed enlarged front teeth, but behind them on the bottom jaw the dentition formed a large blade. These serrated premolars, known as Plagialicoid teeth are the multi's most distinctive feature, and would have helped this animal live an omnivorous diet. But as multi's evolved through the Cenozoic, they would eventually branch off from small tree climbers to more specialized animals, one of the first groups of mammals to do so. The first large-ish terrestrial animals after the dinosaurs was a group of completely herbivorous Taniolabididae. Jesus, these names are getting rough. Members of Taniolabididae developed their front teeth into gnawing, self-sharpening tools. With these gnawing teeth, they would tackle the tropical vegetation, or in some of their relatives, the newly spreading grass of the Cenozoic. And some got as big as beavers. The largest was Taniolabis, who might have exceeded 100 kilograms in weight. But as the Cenozoic continued, these archaic mammals' sudden rise would also be met with a fall. As other mammals began to truly take over, leaving the Maltese a dying group of animals. None survive into modern times. The long-lived multituberculates would bite the dust in the supposed age of mammals.
marsupials were just a tad more fortunate than the multi-tuberculates. Although marsupials are now relegated to those things from Australia, they were pretty successful in the age of mammals, at least for a while. And this is after the marsupial's ancestors were hit incredibly hard by the Cretaceous extinction. They would never recover in the Northern Hemisphere. In North America, where once marsupial forerunners were widespread, they would completely vanish until the opossum migrates back through the Isthmus of Panama. It is in the south where the marsupials would be restored. Digs from South America reveal marsupials formed more than 50% of the mammal species there. Like the other mammal groups, the marsupials were simple generalists, not too dissimilar to opossums and shrew possums of today. The little Cassia of Bolivia and its extended family would be the group of marsupials who all Australian marsupials descend from. They got to the other side of the Pacific through the land bridge that was green Antarctica. Because remember, this was a warmer, more interconnected Earth. Also in South America, close relatives of true marsupials would fill a pretty exciting niche, that of carnivores. The sporacidons started off small, but branched into many different carnivorous niches throughout South America. Maolestes is one of the earliest sporacidons, and possessed a prehensile tail, and would have lived a similar life to that of weasels today. Meanwhile, larger members of Sporacidons include the boar hyenids, bear or dog-like creatures which could grow as large as wolves. These animals would convergently evolve the same set of flesh-cutting teeth that the true placental carnivores would possess. And further on, the coincidences would get even more strange, with Sporacidontids convergently evolving a saber-toothed predator Thylacosmilus, while the northern hemisphere was being populated by saber-toothed cats. It would be the more humble true marsupials who would survive. Although the Sporacidont saw great success as the carnivores of South America during the Paleocene, they would eventually be ousted by true carnivores when the Americas collided some time later. With all of these other mammal types waddling about, it's hard to imagine how us placentals were able to get our feet on the ground. Placental mammals in the beginning of the Cenozoic would remain as the small, shrew-like creatures we come to expect from the early era. In fact, there's a confusing amount of little shrew-sized placental mammals who have been traditionally thrown into the archaic insectivores grouping. But this insectivore group isn't really real. It's what we call a wastebasket taxon, a group whose scientists just throw animals into if they have no clue where they should actually go. Confusing taxonomic groups is a staple of the early age of mammals. Many of the species we find fossilized are way too difficult to properly group and is one of the major obstacles in understanding this key time in our prehistory. Anyways, the confusing jumble of insectivores would eventually evolve into more complex and intriguing animals. Once a member of the wastebasket insectivores, the mammals known as Leptictida do not possess any special teeth which would differentiate their diet, but instead its hind limbs had adapted to running or hopping across the forest floor if need be, like shrew kangaroos. Another group of so-called insectivores took to the water to hunt small fish. The Pantalesta order would have lived almost like otters, capable of swimming and catching their food, as well as being agile enough to survive on land. As the Pantalesta's fish-eating habits display, it's not too far of a leap for these insectivores to go from bugs to slightly larger prey. Like Sparacidanta, some placental mammals also took the carnivorous road. These carnivores would split into two groups, one being the true carnivores, who represent the carnivorous mammals of today. But during the early Cenozoic, these would remain humble and generalized predators, comparable to martens. The other group of carnivores at the outset were larger and more successful, that being the Creodonts, a unique and now long extinct order. Evidence shows these animals evolved their carnivorous traits, like their self-sharpening carnassial teeth, independently from true carnivores, Yet in appearance, it would be hard to differentiate the two groups. One early creodont was Ox hyena, which appeared like a cross between a polecat and an unpolled cat. These would be tree climbing predators, able to feed on birds and small mammals. Their larger cousin, Paleonictus paloria, which has the almost frightening name of terrible ancient weasel, would have been the top predator of its North American ecosystem and had jaws built to crush bone. Yet the placental mammals who would prosper early on in the Cenozoic would be the animals who would go the other route and move towards herbivory. 
the large herbivores who used to rule the world were now wiped out, leaving this way of life up for grabs. Thus swooped in the Condylarths. Condylarths are another one of the wastebasket taxons archaic mammals are grouped into, but at least some are believed to be the ancestors of all ungulates, maybe more generally recognized as the hoofed mammals, a group who now dominate the realm of large herbivores. But before they became mighty buffalo and antelope, the Condylarths started out as small omnivores, like Criacus, an arboreal animal who was just as suited to moving on the ground as it was in the trees, and I've been told it would have seemed very similar to a kinkajou. You know, kinkajous. The Condylarchs would continue to diversify and adapt into larger and more advanced forms, yet like I said before, a direct line cannot be drawn from most of these creatures and to the ungulates of today. For instance, Ectoconus had the general body shape of ungulates down, with primitive hoofed feet, a big body about the size of a sheep, and a small brain case. But their teeth suggest these animals shredded hard vegetation, not really similar to the grazing and browsing diets most ungulates would adopt. The generalists would eventually peak with Arctocyon, meaning bear dog, a large omnivore with an impressive set of tusk-like canines. But besides being a condylarth, shares no similarity with the herbivorous ungulates. Only in the animal Phenacodus and its relatives do we see the ungulates possibly arising from. Although it possessed a heavy tail and wasn't entirely herbivorous, Phanacotus appeared to be a capable runner and, like other ungulates, walked on a set of hoofed fingers. These traits for running would only become more derived later on with the advent of Hyracotherium, believed to be an ancestor of the odd-toed ungulates. It is strange to think that every horse and rhinoceros would be descended from these dog-sized herbivores who wandered the forest floor. Although the early Cenozoic is home to many founding members of the now well-established mammal groups, there are plenty of spectacular mammals who simply petered out of existence early on. We've already talked about multi-tuberculates, but another group of near-placental mammals was Simolestins, who got even bigger and bizarrer. Simolestins are yet another confusing and convoluted group of mammals, but the creatures who have been assigned to their order are some of the oddest early mammals as well as some of the first larger creatures to diversify after the Cretaceous. Take for example the Taeniodonts, like Stylinodon, animals who possessed massive boxy skulls, burly arms, large claws, and chisel-like canines which never stopped growing. This all suggests a life spent digging, and like most digging animals it was assumed it fed on roots and tubers it found underground. Yet none of the abrasion marks of those tough foods are left on the teeth, so instead we thank Taeniodonts ate well, we have no idea. Simolestins also contain the largest mammals of their day. Pantodonta was an odd group of mammals who vary in size. Some were presumably agile tree climbers, but the larger ones mirror other mammal megafauna of prehistory. One of the heaviest pantodonts was the Berry Lambda, a 650 kilogram browser who would probably have been immune to any predation as an adult. The feet it might have sat on its sturdy hind limbs and large tail which in appearance would have made it oddly similar to that of a ground sloth, but really there is no connection between these creatures, just another case of convergent evolution. Berry Lambda would be replaced by the other pantodont, Corypidon, whose marsh-loving lifestyle and large tusks should remind all of modern hippopotamus. But after the apex of the pantodonts evolved the first truly gigantic mammals, from an odd group of ungulates arose Owintotherium, a rhino-sized goliath that could look a man in the eye. It seems pretty normal until you get to its face, which, uh, uh, hey, it's something. The rise of Owentotherium and its relatives would signal the beginning of a world you might recognize, a less forested and more grassy terrain. The continents would slide into their current places, and the fauna would only get larger and more familiar. Among all of these weird animals, we may bump into a recognizable face, for the beginning of the reign of mammals correlates to the beginning steps of a humble group of tree dwellers we call primates. Primates originated from, wait, another group of generalist rodent-like animals? What kind of fool do you take me for? He's generalist. He's a generalist. You're a generalist. I'm a generalist. Are there any other generalist I should know about? Meow. I'm out of here. These primate ancestors remain relatively obscure to science, 
But of these little creatures, the Plesiodaphis has one of the more well-known fossil records. Dated to about 55 million years ago, Plesiodaphis still remains rather primitive, with eyes on the side of his head, but displays some traits which will carry on to other primates. And from this animal, a few million years later, we see the first true primates, who closely resembled lemurs. Now with bigger eyes and more complex brains, true primates would begin their path and conquer the trees, and later under humans, the rest of the world. So the origin of the rule of mammals still remains pretty clouded, even with modern research. I won't be surprised if eventually a great deal of this video proves inaccurate and outdated. But still, with what we know now, the early Cenozoic proves an interesting time in Earth's prehistory. It's sort of an awkward middle child in between the more well-studied dinosaurs and the younger mammals which came afterwards, as mammals experimented with what would succeed and what did not. The ones who would eventually die out are still a strange and mysterious array of beasts who once lumbered and hopped within the prehistoric jungles. But the success of some select archaic creatures led to the domination of placental mammal groups like the ungulates, carnivores, and primates, whose triumph is still viewed today. For this, it might be the most important age in understanding the natural world as we know it today. I'll keep this one short. This video unfolded into a much more convoluted and longer project than I thought it would, but I'm still pretty confident in the end product. As always, thanks for photos, videos, artwork, anything else I use to make this. Thank you for watching. See ya.